Good morning again. Uh, we are, uh, I tell you what, my uh, favorite, favorite church song has been sung this morning in this place. And that is the song that has been sung by that little peanut that Julia has to keep taking out for whatever reason. I can't tell you how much I love to hear the scuttlebutt, the scattlings, the whimperings, the cryings, the whatever. I never, ever mind competing with, with kids. Now, Kyle, that doesn't mean you, so keep it down over there. But I, I love that sound. I love the sound of, of, of kids in church. Now, most preachers will, you know, they think, oh, we well, got to you know keep it quiet and you got to listen to me no, no 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 you hear the voice of god more through the crying of an innocent little baby than, than you will through most uh most sermons that you hear i'm ashamed to say but man what a what a beautiful sound that is the future of the church uh, uh, of god's people and and not only that there are uh, uh, that are there are a lot of kids and, and we're you know families having kids but but the the story of how some kids come to be in this place is a beautiful story and I'm so excited that that we have families that that do what uh, the heirs and others are doing and that is the beautiful song that we have heard this morning and Julie, if you can hear me in the nursery, come on in anytime, and we will listen to the second and third verses. Because that's what it's about. That is exactly what that's about, is expanding the kingdom and, uh, you know, any way possible, one baby at a time. This morning, we're going to continue with becoming a Christ-centered church, and I think that if, if we are truly a Christ-centered church, that we would have so much noise going on in here. We would have so many babies and so many kids and so many people that don't know what's going on and don't know when it's supposed to be quiet time and all that and asking questions and all that. And, and man, what a great sound that would be to have so many people who are here worshiping God who don't have a clue what's going on because we are out in the world bringing people the unchurched in here to meet Jesus. What a great thing it would be if we had people every week that we had to, to kind of explain, this, this is what we do, and this is why we do it, and this and that. Oh, okay, great, that's awesome. If we were out in the world doing what Jesus said, oh, don't, 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 don't shush that. That's a great sound. It's like, all right, all right. Dad's like, but I'm tired of hearing it. What? <laughs> you come live at my house. You've got to hear this all the time. Uh, but what if we were out there in the world all the time seeking those people who have no idea what the what the order of worship is supposed to look like what if we were out in the world just like a, 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 what brother scott brought up this morning the feeding of the five thousand if we were going through the countryside and we were just preaching and teaching and talking and, and inviting and, and that there were so many people that just were were flocking to be a part of this and and we had to figure out what, what are we going to feed them all what are, what are we going to do now the problem is is that so often like that example of the feeding of the five thousand it was really a lot of people who were just trying to to come and 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 get the free fish and chips buffet because jesus jesus he he, he scurried up a mega church that day and then ran them all off the next day because they weren't there for uh they weren't there for life transforming gospel we have to ask ourselves that same question this morning are we here for uh, for the life transforming gospel of jesus christ are we here for, uh, for just the comfort that it brings us? You know, just like uh, Jesus feeding all those people uh, and, and, he, and he comforted their hunger, their physical hunger. Are we just here to have some kind of a physical issue, some kind of an emotional uh, guilt or some kind of something? Just keep a, Are we here to, just to have church make us comfortable about who we are and the decisions we've made and, and, and all those things, or are we truly here to get the life 
transforming gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if we are truly here to consume and to, and to, to devour the, the truth about God and, and to uh, accept His gospel and allow the, the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus to transform us, then the rest of this day and all of this week will look completely different. Because it has to. As we are being transformed, our days, our lives, our choices will look different. So as we continue to, to look at what it, what it means to become a, a Christ-centered church, we're going to be talking about uh, today that the, you know, we've been talking about this ministry of reconciliation. You go ahead and hit the next thing, but there you go. That we've been talking about the ministry of reconciliation. We have a responsibility as the church of Jesus Christ, as the, as the body of Christ, as the bride of Christ. Our responsibility is to reconcile the world to him and we do that by reconciling first the the uh, as we reach out we reconcile first ourselves uh, you know we we allow his reconciliation to to bring us closer to him to to reunite us with our with our god and then we go into the world and we invite others into that same reconciled relationship and we do that through making through, through forming relationships with people and living Jesus in front of them, and being the hands and feet, and, and whatever capacity that looks like. And it's going to look completely different from one end of the auditorium to the next, from the front to the back. It's going to look completely different, but, but it's going to look like Jesus. And the, and the ministry of reconciliation, that road to reconciling, begins with mercy. One of the most underrated or underused words i believe that we have to that we have to reconcile we have to reclaim that we have to live in the story of jesus i believe is mercy do we think about our role in 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 the the showing of mercy to those outside of christ so this morning, I, I want to spend a few minutes, and, and I, I've only got a couple. I don't want to go too long because I know that we, uh, you know, if we're, if we're a whole lot past uh, 1130, then, then uh, you know, we're not really happy leaving or we are happy or something. But either way, I don't want to go too long because I understand that the mind can conceive only what the seat can endure. So I don't want to keep you here all day. So you're going to have to listen fast. But in these next few minutes, I want to, to look at that word, mercy, and see what we, can, what we can come away with when it comes to reconciling our, uh, the world through us to God. Because mercy is something that, that we are asked by God to show. If you've got your Bibles, turn with you to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to look at two examples, or, or two things, the teachings of Jesus. Then we're going to go back to the Old Testament and see where these two, uh, these two teachings come from. And, uh, and bear with me because I find this fascinating, and I hope that you do too. But in, G, in G, uh, Matthew chapter 9, we read where, uh, uh, that, uh, where uh, there it is, the calling of Matthew, Matthew 9 and 9. As Jesus went out from there, where, where he was, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners, and that word sinners is in quotations, and what that means is that's a category of people. Now, if you'll remember back to the very beginning of this year or sometime last year, I, I know this is it's, it's like, what, are we getting extra credit for this? And we're not, but, you know, I, taught, I preached a sermon series about categories. Remember that? And, and Satan is the great category. Uh, and he categorizes and he, and he makes different columns and, and different people come into this column and others come into that. And, and, and those columns never mix. Sinner, quote unquote sinner, is a title of people that just means they've been thrown out of the synagogue. They've been separated from, uh, from synagogue, from temple worship, from all that. And so they are, they're on the outs. They're on the outside. That's what that means. 
Whenever you see the word sinner in quotes, just think of somebody who's on the outside, doesn't fit in, whatever. And, and maybe they did bad things. I mean, maybe they are, they, they did sin. But they're, that really means they're just cast out. They're separated. They're other than us. It's that us against them. Now, if that sounds real familiar in today's, you know, uh, social, political, whatever world we live in, we didn't invent this. You know, that, this us against them mentality didn't start with the Republicans and the Democrats. It, it started way back. I mean, way before this even. But he says, okay, so there's, there's these tax collectors and, and sinners, and they came and they ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But, and I love that, I love that but, I love that. So, in one word, Jesus takes a, a compl- uh, now I'm using the air bunnies, he takes a compliment and he turns it into an insult because what he says next, he says, it's not the healthy who need, sit, who, who, uh, need a doctor but the sick. So the Pharisees are thinking, oh, yeah, I'm the healthy, right? Okay. I mean, that's what we would think if we're, you know, because we're the church people. And so we think, okay, well, we're, you know, we don't really need a whole lot of Jesus. We don't need a whole lot of grace because I'm, I'm really not doing a whole lot of bad things. And, you know, you can probably list my sins of the week on one hand. And, and there's people out there who's really running up that whole, you know, that, that grace credit there. And, and so I'm the healthy and they're the six. Oh, okay. All right. I got it. I got it. That, that's who they are. And he says, but, because he knows they're making this comparison in their brain. He says, but. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And again, they're thinking, oh, okay, I'm the righteous. What does that mean? I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Here's what that means. I'm calling the sinners because they're the ones who need a savior. See, the righteous, they don't need a savior. They, they don't need, their, and, and they're not going to listen to a Savior because they got it all figured out. They got it all under control. They got this thing down. Don't, don't worry about me. You know, God, you, you need to go and, and worry about all these, these sinners out here and these, you know, these outcasts because they're the ones that are really the problem. I, I'm good. I, you know, I've got this taken care of. Is that, is, that, is that something that we would be proud for Jesus to say about us? Would, would we want Jesus to call us? The righteous in this situation? I don't, I don't think so. Because he's really saying, because you, you're not going to listen anyway. You, you're not going to listen to me anyway. And, and, he, and that proves out throughout his ministry. But what I want to focus on is he says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Go over to Matthew chapter 12 now. If you look at Matthew chapter 12, we're going to read verse 1 through 14, and there, there's going to be some lengthy readings, and then I'm going to make a point, and then we're going to be done. So you're going to have to hold on to this one point today, and we're going to read, you know, kind of visit it for the next few weeks. But in Matthew 12, starting in verse 1, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some of the heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Now, we could spend a lot of time going into all of the details about why it was unlawful uh, to pick the heads of grain and, and all that sort of, it's about working on the Sabbath and, and, you know, all of those things. And there's all these regulations and rules. And he answered, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? Now, there's a little insight into the, the psyche or the, the personality of Jesus right there. And, and, and I think he was a smart aleck. And I love that. Because as Grant can attest, so am I. I was talking about Grant. You be quiet. He answered, haven't you read? See, that's an insult. Haven't you read? Of course we've read. We've read this whole thing. We've read every scroll. We've memorized them all. We could quote those scrolls to you. What are you talking about, haven't you read? Of course I've read. Now, how many times do we do that when we go through, a, when we talk about a scripture? Well, hey, turn over in your Bibles to this, this, this. Oh, yeah, I know what that's talking about. I know what that means. 
I got that one figured. I got that one. That's good. I, I know that one. I can quote you that one. Oh, okay. Haven't you read? Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? And at that point, I think that's when they were like, yeah, we've read that, and we don't know what to do with that passage, so we were hoping you wouldn't bring it up. He entered the house of God. He and his companions ate the consecrated bread. Now, growing up in the King James, we heard this as the shoe bread, the show bread. But it's consecrated. It's not for every, it's only for the priests. They're the only ones, which, which was not lawful, th- for, lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law? Again, an insult. I love that. I love it when you can insult someone right to their face and they don't even get it. I do that to Ken all the time. Um, just kidding. He knows I'm insulting him. Uh, no. Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple desecrate the day and yet are, are innocent? I tell you uh, that one greater than the temple is here. If you had known all what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So again, Jesus says, why don't you know what this word means? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now, two different times, they brought up this whole, you know, this idea of, of the law. They, you know, they brought up this whole idea of, of, of uh, the rule of God has, has stated there are things that you do and there are things that you don't do. And we got a pretty good handle on those lists, don't we? The things you do and the things you don't do. And the reason that there are things you do and things you don't do are because there are people that you want to be and there's people that you don't want to be. That's that's what he's teaching. That's that's what he's trying to get across to these these guys. There's things you do and there's things you don't do. And the things that that you do cause you to be one type of person, either a person you want to be or a person you don't want to be. Where does this idea come from? This, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Because Jesus didn't make these words up. He he didn't come up with this. He didn't give them a a, a new reality to think about. He's quoting something that, again, they should have read. Again, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me over to Hosea. Hosea chapter, uh, chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord. Now, this is being written about 114 years before the the nation is uh, is captured and and oppressed and and, before they're handed over uh, to uh, Babylon and and Assyria. It says, come, let us return to the Lord. He, He has torn us to pieces. But he will heal us. He he has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, and and we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge, a better word for that, honestly, is to let us know. Let us know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like like the spring rains that water the earth. What can I do with you, Ephraim? This is God talking. What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist. At first, that's a, oh, that, that sounds nice and refreshing. No, that's not what he's going for. Like the early dew that disappears. Your love is like the morning mist that's like here and gone. Your commitment to me your, your, your steadfastness, your, you, you, your paying attention, your knowing of me is, is here one day and gone the next. God forbid he says that about us. That he says, your love for me is like the morning mist. You're, you're there for church, but by the time you leave, it's gone. You see, you see where we're going with this? It's not just about what we do, you know, here in the assembly and in the feeding of the 5,000. It's why are we here? Are we here to be transformed so that we can go out and do radical things on behalf of the kingdom? So that we can have a lifestyle and a living, uh, you know, so that we can carve our life out of a, a, you know, out of a radical uh, newness of the gospel. 
or that we can just look like everybody else except for well, we have this commitment on Sunday. But the good news is, is when it's over, we go to lunch. He says, what can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore, I will cut you into pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. My judgment flashed like lightning upon you, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. That's where that comes from. Jesus says to the Pharisees, you, you guys, y'all know a lot. But go learn what it means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. But you see, this isn't the first time that, that even this sentiment shows up. You've got to keep turning. Go to Isaiah. In Isaiah, now th- this again is, is a, a prophecy of, of, of get it together. Get it together, guys. He says, hear the word, verse 10, hear the word of the Lord, your rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, your people of Gomorrah, the multitude of your sacrifices. What are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you? I mean, have we ever thought about that? When we assemble and we, we say eloquent prayers and we sing beautifully written songs and we hear pray, you know do we ever think is, is this what did god even ask for this what we're doing right now the, this this moment in time that that we protect like nothing else and, and, and don't don't act like we don't because let me tell you something, you let me change just a couple things in here and we would lose our minds. Lose them. But did God even ask for any of this? I mean, are we, are we doing this for us or are we doing it for him? Because doing it for us makes us feel better. Doing this for him transforms us completely. How transformative are these experiences? He goes on to say this. When you come before, who's asked you for this? This trampling of my courts. <laughs> what, what he's talking about, he's, the, the, the temple courts. And, and people just, flood. so like, think about this. If, if, uh, uh, if in here, this were, if this were all outside and we had, we had grass in here, this is beautiful grass. Now, I don't know about you guys, but at my house, we have some really nice grass. It, but I'm a farmer, basically, and that's my crop, all right? So I'm out there, and I'm watering it and taking pH samples and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's like, it's like Tim when he's smoking a, a, a you know, meat. It's like really into it, you know, and I'm all about, like, my grass and all. And, and so, you know what I don't like? I love kids in church. I hate kids on my lawn. I'm literally that guy. Get, get off my lawn. I'm just kidding. I don't yell at them to get off my lawn. But when they do leave stuff in my yard, I'm like, well, okay, that's going to kill the grass right there. Let's move that. And so if I have like a, a party or something going on and I've got in my backyard, the grass is all beautiful and cut and bagged and sometimes it's mulched and sometimes it's bagged and, you know, it's always fertilized and all that. But if you have a party and you go back out there and everybody's there and we're having a good time and we're talking and, you know, fellowship and playing a little cornhole and all that kind of stuff. And then what happens when everybody leaves? Grass is all smooshed down. So I'm out there with a, with, with a rake. I'm like gently Oh, stand up, sweetheart. It's good. It's all right. Daddy's here. Because they've trampled my grass. Now, what God's, he's saying, you, you come in here, you're doing all this. I didn't even ask you to do it. And when you leave, my yard looks terrible. I mean, he's more worried. He says, you're coming, you're trampling my courts. I would just as soon you not even do any of that so that I don't even have to do the work of getting the grass back alive after you've left. That's what he's saying here. 
That's the sentiment uh, he's talking about. And these are things that were commanded. You know, the, 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 this sacrifice and that sacrifice, the grain offering, the burnt offerings, all those things. They're commanded. And he's saying that, yeah, you're doing them, but I would much rather you not get on my grass and give me these worthless offerings. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They've become a burden to me. I'm weary of, of, bear, of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I'm not going to listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. And you know what the doing right is? I mean, we, if I asked you, what does it mean to do right, make a list of all, man, we would have a litany of things that we're not supposed to do. Don't drink this, don't smoke that, don't go to these places, don't look at this, don't touch that, don't talk to this person. Don't. We would have a list of things to do of what it means to do right. Most of them would be prohibitions that go along with morality. And before you email me, I am not against morality. Let's all be good people, okay? Let's just not depend on that. So he says, look, you know what it means to learn to do right? Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Then be merciful. When you see people in need, help them. When, when you see people who are hurting, help them, soothe them. When, when we see things that are, when we see people being oppressed, lock arms with them. Stand up against oppression. Stand with the oppressed. Help those who are in need. Jesus wants us to understand the meaning of I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Okay, now, now keep that in, in, your, in your head for just a second because I'm going to shift gears real quickly and make it something about 2021. I saw this great graphic this week. Now, I grew up in, you know, the, the Reagan years. As, you know, that was the very first president that, that I remember, you know, caring about being elected, blah, 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 all that. You know, it was in the early 80s. I was nine years old when he was elected. And I remember the don't do drugs, just say no. Because drugs are bad, right? I mean, you know, we, and, and so that was the whole thing is that, well, you know, there, you don't want to do, and I went to a Christian school and we talked about, well, you know, don't do this and don't do that. Don't do drugs. Don't drink. Don't, and, and don't do those things. I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that. But I saw a great graphic this week. One of the things that I, I you know, you don't, don't do this. Don't smoke marijuana because that's a gateway drug. And that leads to other things that are destructive and da, 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 da. You know, don't drink because that's a gateway. I saw a great graphic this week. Marijuana is not a gateway drug. Alcohol, not a gateway drug. Prescriptions, not a gateway drug. Now, before you say, well, Shane, preaching for drugs. No, 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 just keep listening. Those aren't gateway drugs. You know what are gateway drugs? Physical and sexual abuse. Depression is a gateway drug. Self-loathing and depression are gateway drugs. Being stressed and, 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 and anxiety, those are gateway drugs. You know what's a gateway drug? Pain, hurt, disappointment. Living in a broken world next to broken people who do broken things to other broken people. And, and so, and I'm not condoning any of this, I'm just saying that there are circumstances that I don't want to say cause because that takes all personal responsibility away from it. But there are circumstances that, praise God, most of us in this room have never had to experience that make life such a way that we will look for or people look for any escape from reality. And they cause devastating results and, and life-altering circumstances and, and things that we would never want to go through. 
And our job as Christians are, is not to stay pure from those people. Our job as Christians is to get next to them and show them there's a better way to ease the pain of brokenness. Jesus is the answer to that. The gospel is good news. It isn't a, an unwieldy list of, of unkeepable, unnumerable commands. It is the truth that we are sinners lost and dying without a Savior. And Jesus says, come to me if you're burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest from the pain, from the depression, the self-loathing, the anxiety, the, the doubt, the confusion, all of those things. The problem is, is the church over years has evolved into this, this country club for the righteous instead of a, a launching pad for missionaries to go into the world and to do justice and love mercy. When we see people overcome by the fallenness of this world, what is our response? Are we disgusted by the actions of others and the lifestyle, uh, uh, lifestyle of those choices that the, the bad choices produce? Are we glad that it's, it, it's not us? Are we proud that, that we're, we're better than that? We've made better choices than that. We've had, uh, you know, we're, we, we're farther along than that. Or do we simply turn away and avoid looking? See, this is a haunting verse because I've heard and I've preached way more sermons on the sacrifices that we are called to make than the mercy that we are asked to show. You see, what, what we've done this morning is we've looked at the narrative of the gospel. We've looked at the, uh, the, a command that Jesus gave. And then trace that command back to, to the, the, the practical working reality of that. And we've learned that what God desires from us is mercy and not sacrifice. And you ask, well, what, what's, the sac we, we don't, what, what's the sacrifice he's talking about? It's those people. It's those people. You see, we believe as, as Christians that it's more important for us to sacrifice them to the world to keep ourselves pure than it is to have a relationship with them and, and, and bring them along into the gospel of Jesus. You see, when, when, when Jesus was eating with, with Matthew and the other tax collectors and the other sinners, and, and let me just put that into some, because that, that's some pretty benign wording i mean we don't love paying taxes but i mean i don't think we're gonna you know speed up in the road if we see a tax collector right i mean tax collectors to us that's that's not like you know ooh, for shame and sinners i mean you know we all are we we call ourselves we're all sinners i mean you know we're all sinners so we you know we've whitewashed those two things so for us we say oh tax collectors and sinners and well sure jesus eat with them okay What if you came over to my house and around my table I had trans people and homosexuals and drug addicts and prostitutes? You know, th those, those people. Let's, let's make it 2021, shall we? Because tax collectors and sinners, that just doesn't really get enough. That doesn't get our juices flowing. But, but you know what he's talking about? He's talking about though, you know, those drug addict prostitutes, what, all those, all those, those uh, uh, categories that, that we do our best to stay away from. Homeless, alcoholic, abusive, whatever it is. But you see, all of those activities are the result of, of some pain, some brokenness, some reality that, praise God, maybe we haven't had to experience. And what Jesus is calling us to be are a people who reach out to them. 
who don't shun, who don't walk away from, who, who don't separate ourselves, but, but who make an effort to find and show mercy to. And it's not just mercy like, oh, here you go, here's a couple of bucks, man, God be with you. No, it's mercy like, hey, you have nobody in your life. I'll be in your life. You, you have nothing positive going on right now. I will be positive and I will be, I, I will be your friend. You have no friends, I'll be your friend. You have no family, I'll be your family. That's mercy. That's what he's talking about. It isn't just airmailing some benevolence over there. It's sitting down and eating. It's walking the dusty streets with. It's reaching out our hands and touching them. Because there is no us and them. No matter what point, policy, no, no matter you know, what point of view, you, there is no us and them. There's only us. And God is calling us to leave no one behind. Now, the song of invitation is not, what will you do with Jesus? So this is erroneous. What's our song of invitation? Steadfast love of the, Lord. the steadfast love of the Lord. Will we, will we live and display and show the steadfast love of the Lord this week as together we stand and as we sing?